bit tricky. It's not that one. It's that one. It seems like it should be that one, but it's that piece. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody get up and move to a different position. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. I want to thank you, Father, for um, just the sense of wonder that you've placed in Vicki, that she has a unique window to look at you and to just pull wonder and uh, a joyful sense of your glory out. And we... Would you prepare our hearts to receive it, Lord God? We want that wonder that you've given to her and that understanding, that unique understanding, that perception, those keen eyes that she has, Lord God. Would you let us receive from them as she's releasing today? Um, and would you bless her in the process that we would not just be blessed through her, but that you would bless her in the pouring out? I ask for a double portion of strength today, all through the day. And just um, would you guard her rest tonight afterward, Lord? In Jesus' name, amen. I'm just going to pray for myself. Is that okay now? Okay. Um, so, Father God, I just um, come before you. I just want to share your word. You know I'm a weak speaker, Lord God, but your word is strong, Lord God. So I just pray that you give me. Uh, the ability to do a, a strong word about weakness in Jesus' name. Uh, so I titled this message, Without Limits. And I got that from a movie, because you guys know I'm a runner, and there's a movie about Steve Prefontaine, who a, was a big runner, and uh, they called it Without Limits. And Jacob's going to get a picture out for us eventually. Um, so this is kind of about striving, and actually, uh, Josh was praying right into it. Actually, uh, everyone always seems to pray into the message, but um, with Josh's verse about Paul, and he says, um, you know, am I going to be one who beats as to the air, or um, what does he say, boxes into the air, or runs to be disqualified, or... He beats his own flesh so he won't be disqualified. So that sounds like someone who's working hard, right? That's not lazy, right? And so that's the paradigm here is that what we also know, it's not by might nor by power, but by his spirit. So, so where is the in-between of we have to do something, we have to work hard, but it has nothing to do with us and everything to do with his spirit. So that's kind of what this is about today. Um, in Proverbs, it says, the soul of the slugger craves and gets nothing, while the soul of the diligent is richly supplied. So just having the cravings for those things is not enough. You have to be diligent to get what your soul desires. And is there a way you can show the whole thing at once or no? That's okay. Can you guys see the pictures? You don't have to see them very clearly. But, um, yeah, so the, the, the sluggard um, or the diligent gets filled um, or richly supplied. So there's a lot. If you read through the Proverbs, there's a lot about the strength of man gets you nothing, but the lazy man gets nothing too, right? And, you know, the harvest, you can't get the harvest without doing anything. You can't say, I really wish all that fruit and vegetables would come be in my barn, right? It's like somebody has to go out there and get it. But God did the miracle to make the growth and the, the food to come there, right? So this is kind of about the striving. So... So man has always been troubled by his limits, but also striving with his limits. And it's like we've always had this desire to move past our limits, 
and you know we've there's a space you know to make it this space well before that it was flying I have the little first airplane down there that's you know to fly there was a striving to fly um, to cure cancer to cure AIDS we strive to cure those things and uh, the climb heights Mount Everest um, or go in the depths of the sea, scuba diving, you know, explore these limitations and strive against them. And, uh, you know, with Mount Everest, I was thinking there, people have literally lost their lives to attempt to climb Mount Everest, but would we lose our self to climb God's holy mountain? You know, and um, so then the towers, the striving to have the highest tower, that's like, the never ending story for humankind. I mean, if we go back to Genesis 11, and I'm gonna be jumping in the Bible a lot, so be ready. All right, so it says the whole earth had one language and one speech, and it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. And then they said to one another, come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They had brick for stone and they had asphalt for mortar. And they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down to see a city and a tower which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, indeed, the people are one and they have all one language. And then that is what they begin to do now. Now nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. So come, let us go down and there, confuse their language so they do not understand one another's speech. So as you can see, we haven't stopped with our strivings, have we, as, as mankind? And I have a runner on there because obviously that's near and dear to my heart, but any kind of sport, it's a striving to achieve. But when we think of the Olympics, um, which began with uh, the track and field type events, the how far can you jump? How high can you jump? How fast can you run? It's always been a fascination that we think that man ran that fast. No one could ever run faster than that. And then someone else breaks the record and we're like, how can this be? But we, but we are limited, aren't we? Because we are a human body that has to get from here to there. There's eventually gonna be a limit to what the human body can do. And, um, you know, it's interesting with the marathon that came across, um, the, the legend is, is um, I'm not gonna say his name right, Fedodipides, <laughs> Fedodipides. Um, he was a messenger and he ran from marathon in Greek to Athens. And it was um, legend that it was exactly the length of a marathon, which is like 26 miles and something um, after that, like, I don't know what the something is, like 0.2, yeah. And dropped dead as he landed there with his message. And so it was thought that that was the farthest this, the human body can go. And, uh, but if you know now, there's ultra marathons that are like, even like double that, you know, it's like, we just keep wanting to push, how far can that human body go? How high of a building can we make? How big of a star can I get? Um, who can come up with the best song? Or, you know, there's, there's millions of things we can strive for, right? Artistry, um, you know, and if we read um, Ecclesiastes, we know that it all comes to nothing in the end. And, but what is it about that that passion and that drive and that desire? So I'll take you back to where God took me when he started talking to me about this. So I'm going to be in Isaiah 7. And starting first in verse 13, it says, Then he said, Hear now, O house of David, is it a small thing for you to weary man? Or it, is it, yeah, is it a small thing? But will you weary my God also? And I don't know about you, but that makes me think of the 
the story that Jesus told about the persistent widow when she went and bugged the unrighteous judge enough um, that he's like, man, I'll just give her what she wants so she doesn't worry me anymore. And then this question here, whenever there's a question in the Bible that always, I'm like, I wanna, what is that? He says, but can you worry my God also? And because the rest of that proverb says, um, it's not a proverb, but it's a story, parable. Um, says, you know, if we cry out to our God day and night, will he not avenge us? Um, <clears throat> and he says, but will he really find faith on the earth? And so then I got to thinking, I was like, what does it take to wear he got out? You know, if it's, it's just a small thing to wear a man, like, you know, she probably only had to come in like three times and that judge is like, I've had enough. I can't take this. I mean, our kids can wear us out pretty quickly, right? Um, <clears throat> so what does it take to wear God who has, his spirit is patience. You know, he says, you know, don't count it slack that he um, hasn't come yet, but he's patient. You know, I was like, oh, wait, his patience could last forever, couldn't it? What does it take to wear God down. And um, so in Isaiah 40, I'm going to go back to Isaiah 7, so don't lose that spot. It um, says, have you not known, have you not heard, has it been told to you from the beginning, have you not understood from the foundations of the earth, I'm in verse 21, sorry, it is he who sits above the earth of the circle and its inhabitants are like a grasshopper who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. He brings the princes to nothing and he makes the judges of the earth useless. And if you skip over to 28, have you not known, have you not heard the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary. His understanding is unsearchable. So I'm going to stop there for now. But wait, he neither faints nor is weary. But he asks us in Isaiah 7, will you not weary God also? So what's the backstory to that question? And so if you go to the beginning of Isaiah 7, it says, Now came the pass in the days of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, the son of Uzziah, king of Judah, that Rezin, king of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Remlia, and king of Israel, went up to Jerusalem to make war against it, but could not prevail against it. And it was told to the house of David, saying, Syria's forces are deployed in Ephraim. I'm going to skip down. It says, Then the Lord said to Isaiah, Now you go out to meet Ahaz and Sherub Jeshru, your son, at the end of the adduct from the upper pool of the highway of Fuller's Field, and say to him, take heed and be quiet. Do not fear or be faint-hearted for these two stubs of smoking firebrands for the fierce anger of Reza and Syria and the son of Ramelia. So they have decided to go against Judah and trouble it. And the Lord God says, it shall not stand, it shall not come to pass, for the head of Syria is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is Rezin. Within 65 years, Ephraim will be broken so that it will not be a people. The head of Ephraim is Samaria, and the head of Samaria is Romilia's son. If you will not believe, surely you shall not be established. So he says, if you will not believe, you won't be established. So the opposite of that is if you will believe, you will be established. So this King Ahaz, which who he is, he's the father of Hezekiah. That's a lot of times I try to, okay, I know who Hezekiah is. He's the one who asked for extra life. And so he's the father of Hezekiah. And um, God is basically saying to him, he's like, he's like, don't worry about those people that are gonna come in against you. If you believe, will you not be established? But what is Ahaz's response to the Lord? He says, Moreover, the Lord again said to Ahaz, saying, Ask a sign for yourself, the Lord your God. Ask it either in the death or in the height above. 
But he has said, I will not, nor will I test the Lord. Then he said, Here now, O house of David, is a small thing for you to weary men, but will you weary my God also? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and his name shall be called Emmanuel. So at first glance, that kind of sounds, um, uh, my ears are ringing, sorry. Um, this kind of sounds like a good response from Ahaz, right? Because he says, I will not test the Lord. But it's false humility because if the Lord God comes to you and says, ask me anything from the heights or the depths, like in the, uh, I think I wrote that verse somewhere in Corinthians, it says that Christ may, this is in Ephesians, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith and be rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge that you may be filled with the fullness of God. So here, the God through the prophet Isaiah is speaking to King Ahaz and saying, ask anything in the heights and the depths above. And he says, I will not ask, nor will I test the Lord. And God's mad. He says, you can weary men, but you can't weary me. And he says, fine, I'll give a sign for myself. And he gives the most, like, one of our most important prophetic signs ever, the sign, the birth of Jesus coming, God with us. And, I mean, just imagine what King Ahaz missed there. So if you want to read more about King Ahaz, it's in um, 2 Kings 16 and 2 Chronicles 28. I think I'm going to turn to 2 Chronicles 28. But... Um, so if you're familiar with reading the, the kings, the stories of the kings, which he's the king of Judah. This is when the, after Solomon, basically, they were split into two kingdoms. It was always Israel and then Judah. Um, and it always starts off by telling you whether they did what was right in the eyes of the Lord or not. So King Ahaz, he was... Um, it says he did not do what was right in the sight of the Lord and his father David had done. Um, so he made images to Baals. He burned his kids. It says he put them through the fire. That means he sacrificed his own kids. Um, and then he knew when he knew that these armies were coming against them, Israel and uh, the other two places. <laughs> I forgot what they were, like Syria. And so... What did he do? He started trying to negotiate with other kings. And he took the precious things out of the temple, like the, the gold and the silver, and um, started giving it to other people to say, you know, help me get out of this trouble I'm about to get in. And where we know from Isaiah that, that God had offered and said, you don't have to worry about this trouble if you would only believe. But he didn't. He tried to use his strength and knowledge and wealth to trade um, for his safety. And um, verse 22, I wanted to point out, it says, Now in the time of his distress, King Ahaz became increasingly unfaithful to the Lord. That is the King Ahaz. So instead of in time of distress going, uh, uh, humbling himself before the Lord, he became increasingly um unfaithful now it's interesting because that that thing where he said if you will believe will not the lord establish you well his great great grandfather in second chronicles twenty twenty, was king jehoshaphat and he was also the king of judah now he rep responded differently didn't he he um this is his saying in Second Chronicles 20, 20. He says, Hear me, O Judah, and you inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, and he shall establish. Believe his prophets, and you shall prosper. And Jehoshaphat and all the people of Judah, they did. They believed. And what did God had asked them to do? They were going against the people that wanted to destroy them. But they went 
Um, let me see if I can back up a little. Um, in verse 15, he says, Listen, all you of Judah, inhabitants of Jerusalem, and you, King Jehoshaphat, says the Lord to you, do not be afraid nor dismayed because of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, it's God's. Tomorrow, go down against them. They will surely come up by the ascent of Ziv, and you will find them at the end of the brook before the wilderness. You will not need to fight this battle. Position yourselves, stand still, and set your salvation of the Lord who is with you, O Judah and Jerusalem. Do not fear or be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord is with you. So they believed what the prophet told them, and they listened, and they went out praising and worship with, um, and I think you find out then the, the army got confused and they killed themselves, basically, if I remember right. So they believed in the Lord and he positioned them. So it was different, but they had to go out in humility and in weakness. So as I'm thinking about this, okay, so how do we weary God? How do we weary God? And um, Psalm 24 says, who may ascend the hill of the Lord, who may stand in his holy place, he who has clean hands, a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to an idol, nor sworn deceitfully. <coughs> he shall receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from God of his salvation. This is Jacob, the generation of those who seek him who seek your face. <coughs> Sorry. So I know we talk about this verse a lot, and but just bear with me. because So I'm thinking about, okay, Jacob, he got the blessing, right? He wrestled through the night, right? We all know the story. We hear it over and over again. He wrestled through the night. He persevered. He got the blessing. But as I'm thinking about this, how do we weary God? So we're going to turn to Genesis 32. <clears throat> All right. And God calls us the Jacob generation. So let's think about Jacob for a minute. We know about him. So we know, uh, for example, like Daniel, he had um, such good character that they couldn't even find anything against him, right? And then we have um, like Joseph who um, fleed from when the woman tried to tempt him into adultery. And, you know, signs of good character. We know there's others like David who had weaknesses and things. So when we think about Jacob, a lot of his stories, like, you know, his name means um, supplanter. And he came out of the womb grabbing his brother's heel. And um, we know that he was a deceiver. He tricked to get what he wanted, right? And <clears throat> um, so it's interesting. So it's like, hmm, what is it, what is it about the character of Jacob? And... Um, these don't seem like good things. And, but we also know he persevered. He worked seven years to, um, seven years and seven days to marry the girl that he wanted to marry, right? And um, so he tricked his brother out of his birthright and his blessing. And he was pretty cunning when he worked for his uncle. Is it his uncle? Laban? Laban? You know, he would say, okay, all these sheep, certain sheep will be mine, but apparently he had knowledge of like, well, if you have them eat of the bark or something, then they would be striped. You know, I don't remember the story exactly, but he knew, you know, how to get the most sheep, and he's pretty cunning. And there's one thing that God tells us that it always kind of, there's the parable of the shrewd manager, and I always kind of like don't get that. I'm like, what? 
Okay, because he, like, he realized something was coming, and he thought and made a plan, like, how he was going to get through. And he's, um, the the manager's like, good job. And I'm like, what? He, like, tricked you out of some of your money. But, but God tells us, be as wise as serpents, but innocent as doves. So how do we... So if we want to climb that holy mountain, we want to have pure hearts and clean hands, not sworn deceitfully, not risen our hands to an idol, but we want to be wise, right, and cunning. And um, so there was something about that cunningness of of Jacob to to strive for what he wanted and to, to use that wisdom and to see what's coming and make the right choice. And so here, Jacob in verse 32, he's just left his um, father-in-law, Laban, Laban, or however you say it. So Jacob went on his way and the angels of God met him. When Jacob saw them, he said, this is God's camp. And he called the place Mahanim, which means the double camp, which also um, I read could be that there was one before and one after. So it kind of reminds you of the Exodus when the cloud went before and um, behind. Um, it says, Jacob sent messengers before him to Esau, his brother. And he commanded them, saying, Speak thus to my lord Esau. This your servant Jacob says, I have dwelt with Laban and stayed with him there until now. I have ox and donkeys, flocks, male and female servants. I have sent to tell my lord that I may have favor in your sight. When the messengers returned, they, we came, your brother Esau, and he is coming to meet with you, where 400 men are with him. So Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed, and he divided the people that were with him, the flocks and the herds and the camels, into two companies. And he said, if Esau comes to one company and attacks them, then the other company, which is left, will escape. Then Jacob said, O oh God of my father Abraham and God of my father Isaac, and the Lord who said to me, return to your country and to your family, and I will deal well with you. I am not worthy of the least of all mercies and all your truth which you have shown your servant for I crossed over this Jordan with my staff and now I've become two companies deliver me I pray from the hand of my brother and from the hand of Esau for I fear him lest he come attack me and the mother my and the children for you said I will surely treat you well and make your descendants as the sand in the sea which cannot be numbered for the multitude so he's recognizing there's trouble coming, right? They, he has messengers that said his brother Esau is coming with 400 men. Why would his brother Esau come with 400 men just to meet him? So I think he's, he knows something's up. So now he's obtained wealth. He's got children. He's got a wife. But now he, he has this fear and so he reminds God of the promises that God's given him. He's like, okay, he said, if, you, if I go back, you're going to take care of me. Um, I don't deserve your mercy, but he prays for deliverance. Now, um, so he's obtained all the strength of man. He has, like, wealth, right, and cattle. He's got a wife. He's got children. He's got 12 sons. And... Uh, but now he, it, it's on the line. He fears losing it all, right? And um, so he's in a moment of weakness. He might not have all his wealth. He might not have his wife and his children. He could lose them. And so he, he sends them over there, but then he goes across the river, and it's nighttime, it says. And he's alone. He says he's been left alone, and it's night, and it's dark. And then it says... A man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. So it doesn't say that Jacob went and wrestled someone. It says a man wrestled him. So it's dark. You're alone. Your brother's out to kill you. And someone starts wrestling you. Who do you think it is? 
there's a good chance maybe he thought it was his brother there to kill him. So they're wrestling. Is that a good wrestling move? And uh, I watched a couple wrestling matches, and I think it's pretty hard. Like, isn't it like after like 15 minutes, you're pretty like exhausted? Or is it longer than that? Three minutes? <laughs> so, so after wrestling an hour, he could have been like, yeah, that I did pretty good there. That was an hour. I mean, do you remember what Jesus said to his disciples? Could you not pray with me one hour? Hmm. But we don't know that he knows this is God necessarily. We know that he's wrestling for his life. Okay, so he's made it through the night. He's wrestled. And it says, now when he saw that he did not prevail, now these he's have a capital H, so that's the angel of the Lord who he's wrestling with. So he's like, wow, okay, this guy, wow, he's pretty determined. He's made it through the night. It doesn't say that that the angel is exhausted, does it? It just says that he sees that um, he hadn't prevailed against them yet, which basically means he hadn't got this guy to quit yet. And I don't know, because I've always thought of the story as kind of like, wow, Jacob was so strong, he just like, he wrestled through the night to get the blessing. He went to get what he wanted. But I think the the answer of this story is a little different than him just wrestling. Um, <clears throat> so it says the angel, he touched the socket of his hip, and Jacob's hip was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, let me go for the day breaks. And then it says, he said with the lower capital H, so that's Jacob, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And then he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have struggled with God with men and have prevailed. So Jacob has made it through the night. They're still wrestling. But all this angel does, touches his hip. Boom. Where is he? He's down. He's weakened. I read online that for your hip to go out of socket is some of the worst pain you can experience. And it requires a huge force that usually it's only car accidents that can take your hip out. And this angel, he's out. And what is... So it says that Jacob still hung on. So I've always pictured him being in a place of strength, that he still hung on to that, to that angel. But no, he was down, out, on the ground, and he hangs on. And he says, don't leave until you bless me. And what does that remind you of? Does that remind you of the woman who bled for 12 years, and she reached out, and she grabbed onto that robe and the power came out. She was in a place of weakness and humility. And there's a secret to this little passage that I never noticed before. But if we turn to Hosea, the prophet Hosea 12 tells us a little bit more about Jacob. The Lord also brings a charge against Judah, and I will punish Jacob according to his ways, according to his deeds, I re he will recommence them. He took his brother by the heel and the womb, and he struggled in his strength, or in his strength he struggled with God. Yet he struggled with the angel and prevailed. He wept and sought favor from him. He found him in Bethel. And there he spoke to us, that is, the Lord God of hosts. The Lord is a memorable name. So that he wept. If you look up that Hebrew word, that's like weep bitterly, mourn, beg for mercy, travail. So we missed that. He wasn't in strength. He was on the ground. All his strength taken away. If you're any kind of athlete, if you lose your leg, you know, you're at your weakest point, and he's crying and weeping and mourning and saying, bless me, 
because he knows that his brother's coming, right? Why didn't the Lord just bless him at the beginning? He knew he was going to bless him anyway, right? He took him through that place of taking away all his strength so he had nothing else left to stand on. He couldn't even stand on his own leg, actually. And he was marked for life after that. This is they wa He walked with a limp the rest of his life. Prevailing or wrestling with God or through prayer, it's hard on your flesh. It breaks your flesh. You're marked for life. You're changed. You're different afterwards. The way that Jacob prevailed, I believe, he didn't prevail in power and strength. He prevailed in weakness. That's what touched the Lord's heart when he was at his weakest point, and he cried out to the Lord for the blessing. And that's the Lord, sometimes we want to pray away the wrestle. As soon as a little bit of strain comes, we're like, Lord, Lord, help me, get it away. But he's trying to work something in us, in our heart, to get us to that point, because we don't realize how much we rely on our own strength that we all the time. And that's why Paul said, he says, I be my own flesh. That's where the striving is, it's in our hearts, like, the, the righteous man or the un, what it was the tax collector went before the Lord and he beat his chest and he said, Lord, have mercy on me. That's what he got Jacob to the place where he cried out for mercy and for blessing and realizing he had nothing. He had nothing. It was all just the Lord. The Lord had what he needed, the blessing. And the Lord was withholding the blessing into the to right moment because we know tribulation produces perseverance. Perseverance produces um, character, and character produces hope. And so we need to go after that, that beating of the flesh, but it's his strength, his spirit. Like, how do we do that? It's like, and it's literally, it's on your knees. And it's wrestling through that prayer. You know, we think, oh, we get through 20 minutes of prayer. Ooh, that was hard. And it's just like any mus muscle. If you want to be a strong runner, if you want to run a marathon, I mean, you're not going to wake up tomorrow and run a marathon, are you? So why do we think, oh, yeah, tomorrow when I need to, I'll pray through the whole night? You got to start somewhere, right? And, you know, I read these stories, like that's the great cloud of witnesses. That's what I like to, to hear these stories of people who've gone before us. And like, um, there's one man named David Brainerd. He was dying with tuberculosis, which everyone used to die from back in the day, what they call it, consumption. And... Um, he was weak, but he would go out in the winter and pray all night long. And he wasn't praying for himself. He was praying for the lost souls. And, you know, the Lord was speaking to me this morning as I was praying about this message, and I was thinking, and I was, because I've had a sore throat all week, and it's still kind of here, and I've been praying, Lord, take my sore throat away, and I can cry and moan about my sore throat because I can feel it right there and I'm aware of it. And he said, where's your prayers for those who are getting slit in the throat? I'm like, oh, you know, I get my martyrs thing in the mail, voice of the martyrs, and I'll pray then. I'm like, yep, there, I did it. But wait, where's my cries for hours and nights and travailing for, for these people who need our prayers. You know, why do I feel like I did something if I pray for five minutes? You know, I wouldn't train for a marathon for five minutes. If I can work hard in the physical, you know, where's my, my spiritual? And um, 
you know, if you go on in Hosea 12, he says, Deceitful scales are in his hand. He loves to oppress. And Ephraim said, Surely I become rich. I have found wealth for myself in all my labors. They shall find me no iniquity that is sin. And that's the same as um, the Laodicea church. He says, You think you're weak, or you think you become rich and that you're wealthy, but you don't even know that you are are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, naked. Yeah. Counsel is for you to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich in white garments that you may be clothed and the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed and eyes for your eyes all. Like, we don't realize our wretched state and that's that's where the sermon on the mount is so important and that's where that wrestling through the flesh we gotta wrestle through the flesh and get that mark that makes us changed forever where people know they've been through something but it's weakness it's actually weakness the weakest place we can go to our knees and there we actually find strength and as we battle through on our knees and just crying out, that's literally all we can do. We can't, you know, we can't muster up faith within ourselves or, um, you know, spirit. We can't make that happen. Only he can do it. But we can cry out. That's what we can do. We can cry out for it and ask for it and not quit after five minutes. And like, if okay, I got, just like you do five push-ups one day, okay, I'm gonna do six push-ups the next day. You gotta increase it, you gotta increase it until he changes your, from being in the flesh. Like how many times do I do Romans seven where I do the thing that I hate and I don't do the thing that I will to do, but I don't pray about it like I really care, like I really do, I think I do. That's why he says the, the sluggard, who is it, craves and gets nothing. But the soul of the diligent is richly supplied. I can't just like wish that I didn't do the thing that I didn't want to do, but I do it anyway. I got to be diligent in my prayers, in my word, and like seeking the Lord and saying, Lord, I've got nothing. Every time I try, I do the thing I didn't want to do. But I need you to, to change me. And um, so where did I want to go next? It was Isaiah 64. Verse 7, it says, And there was no one who calls on your name, who stirs up himself to take hold of you, for you have hidden your face from us and have consumed us because of our iniquities. You know, the stirs up could be to arouse or to awaken, and who calls on your name could be cries out. And the take hold of you is, is the strength. And like... It says, is there no one who will call on your name, who stirs himself up to take hold of you? Who, who's had taken hold of the Lord? Who's taken hold of him? Who's, who cannot be wearied and is everlasting? And we're like grasshoppers to him. Like, who am I that God is mindful of me? What makes God mindful of me? And you think of Moses, and God said to him, get away from me so I can burn in my wrath. Because Moses had a hold of God. And was it because Moses was strong? No, it was because Moses was humble. There was that relationship there where he spoke to him face to face, and that's what Jacob came to face the face of God and lived, but he was humbled and forever changed and had to let go of his own strength and rely on the strength of the Lord. 
And um, in the Song of Solomon, um, the beloved says to, uh, I might need to just turn to it. Song of Solomon 6, I think. Beloved says, turn your eyes away from me, for they have overcome me. When do we get to the place with the Lord where he says, turn your eyes away from me, you've overcome me. We want to take hold of the Lord. And we take hold of him in our weakness. That's when he, that's when we prevail, it was when he has mercy on us because we cry out in our weakness, just like a little baby. When they're born, they can't do anything. They can't even, like, lift their own head up barely. You know, they have no core strength, nothing. They're completely helpless, completely dependent on their parent to take care of them, right? And that when we get, when we realize, when we mourn, get into that spiritual poverty and that hunger and thirst for righteousness in the Sermon on the Mount, we're at our weakest, that's when he his eyes turn and he sees and um, we cry out for him and he can't but help avenge us. And, you know, just like a father, when I was seeing the wrestling, I pictured, I was like, how would someone prevail against God who's like, can't be worried? And I thought about a father wrestling with his, with his child. Now we all know that a child has no way of overpowering his father even if his father's not that strong, just because he's bigger than him, right? So, and it's like, but what what happens when a father wrestles with his kid? And like, there's a point that, that you see that desire in your kid's eyes to win, you know, kind of like, and you kind of let them win. And that's what, that's what God's trying to do. He, like, we can't overpower God. There's no way, but we can touch his heart. And can we take hold of his heart? Is anyone going to call on his name and stir themselves up to take hold of his heart? Will he really find faith? He said it. He said, will he really find faith? Are we stirring up our faith bit by bit? So we could pray an hour if Jesus asked us to. Or we could pray the whole night if Jesus asked us to or persevere in that travailing for our brothers and sisters who are being martyred or just the fact that we're, we're a cold. We're, we don't have much love and we don't have any power. We're a church with no power. We should be mourning and crying over that. And God can give us the power anytime because that's what that's what the psalm is like. Will he relent and give the blessing? And then if we go back, so we remember the story of Jehoshaphat where they believed in the Lord and he took care of them. And Joel 2, that's where we're at. That's when he says, will anyone call on the name of the Lord and stir himself up to take hold of the Lord? And Jehoshaphat, in Joel 2, we see this army coming, and it says the, like, blood drains from people's faces when they see this army coming, the, their, their, the fear. And um, where is Joel? There it is. It says, multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. Are we okay being a church without power when God said that we would do greater things than he would do? And is it God's fault that we, that we don't have any power? No, it's our own. But, but is there anything we can do to get it? No. But we can cry. Like, it's, it's weird. It's, it's, it's not... We have to do something, but it's not us. We have to do something, but it's not us. We have to get on our knees and cry for the power and the blessing. And we need to recognize our spiritual poverty, that, that we rely too much on our strength. We just we don't realize that we do, but part of the reason we can't persevere in prayer is 
is because we have so many other things to do. We have our food, we have our job, we have all of our comforts surrounding us. And the thing is, we're, you know, we always want to look to someone else and say, they're the lukewarm church there. No, we're the lukewarm church. Just because we got one little coal, we got one coal. We need a burning fire. You know, we need to go for more. Like, and that's why the, the great cloud of witnesses, if we hear these stories, you know, John Wesley, he preached, and it says 180 men were on the floor is dead. Now, are we supposed to say, oh, that's just for him? Or are we supposed to feel um, self-condemnation? No, we're, like, that's where that competitive spirit comes in. It's not, is that's a, that means it's for us, too. And that means the only thing you can work on is your own heart. So you beat that flesh. You drive in. Say, Lord, I want to go after those things. Like, you know, we want to call ourselves forerunners. But we're not even where the other people already forerun, too. We're not forerunners yet. We got to get past them. We got to get past the people of old, the people of the Bible in the Acts church. You know, they were, you know, they just didn't get it. You know, Peter and John and, you know, lot, all the time they just didn't get it. And Jesus was like, oh, you have little faith. How long do I have to bear with you? And, uh, but what happened when the power came? They were different, right? And that's what, yeah, we're of little faith, right? We We don't get it. But when the power comes, then we'll be able to speak with boldness and, and do miracles and signs and wonders and stretch out our hands to heal. It says, it says, grant that to your servants with all boldness. It's when they came together and they were shaken. And that's at the beginning. He says, if, if man will come in together, one mind, anything they set their minds to do, they can do. They're, he's given us something. We can set our minds to do it and do it. But it's weakness, voluntary weakness, giving up our strength, the opposite of what every mankind wants to do, you know, getting on our knees, blessing our enemy, praying for those who are trying to kill us. It doesn't make any sense, but it's, that's our greatest weapon is actually our weakness. It's the most powerful weapon in the world. And why is it the most powerful weapon in the world? Because have you not heard, have you not known the everlasting God of the Lord, the creator of the ends in the earth, neither faints nor is weary. His understanding is unsearchable. And if I go find that passage and it says, He gives power to the weak that those who have no might, he increases strength. Even the youth shall be faint and weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength and shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not be faint. So if we go back to Joel. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. And before that, he says in Joel 2, 12, therefore, it says the Lord, turn to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. Rend your heart, not your garments. Beat that flesh. Return to your Lord God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and great kindness. He relents from doing harm. Moses was able to get God to relent from doing harm because he had taken hold of God's heart. Who knows if he will turn and relent and leave a blessing behind. Jacob convinced God face to face to turn and relent and leave a blessing behind, not when he was strong, but when he was weak and on his knee and crying for mercy. That's when God turned and knew he was ready. And humility, because we need the humility. We don't want the power 
before we have the humility or we'll be destroyed by the power ourselves. And we need his heart. We need his heart for the lost. And, you know, it says, uh, Jesus said somewhere <laughs> in the Bible, he says, fall on the rock and you'll be broken or the rock will crush you. I probably misquoted that. But basically, Jacob was wise. He saw the trouble coming. He knew his brother was coming with 400 men. We know the trouble's coming. The word says it's coming. No matter when it comes, it's coming. We know it's coming. He saw it ahead of time. Are we going to throw ourselves on the rock and be broken by the rock willingly, or are we going to wait till the rock comes and crushes us? And, you know, Jacob was called God prevails. That's what, that's what Israel means, is God prevails. And so really it was God that prevailed, but Jacob prevailed because he joined God. And the story of Jacob is so much like what the whole Israel needs to go through. They, they need all of their strength broken. That's what I think it says in um, Daniel, until the strength of my people is shattered or something like that, you know, until, because now there, you know, there, there are Jews that believe in Jesus, but the ones that don't, they're trying to make plans to figure out how to get be safe or have the right um, defense system and missiles and things, or, um, <clears throat> you know, they're, still trying to trade and figure out their strength. And we do the same thing until we until it's all taken away. And or we can let go now before we have to be sh shattered by the rock. But in that moment there's there's a moment that's why Jacob's name was Israel cuz Israel's going to have that same moment where finally They've gone through the long, dark night. All of their strength is broken. And they see, it says every tribe will mourn him when they see him. And they'll cry out, save now. I pray, oh Lord, oh Lord. What is the rest of it? But... Psalm 118, that's the prophecy. They, they get to the point when they are finally on their knees. You know, the Bible says every knee will bow. You're going to bow no matter what. You're going to be on your knees no matter what. But are you going to do it willingly in advance and receive in that weakness, receive his power? But they will cry out. And it says anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So they, they will cry out and be saved, and that's Israel. But we here in the Valley of Decision, the, and which is the story of Jehoshaphat, and which God chose that for a reason, I believe, because he chose to believe in the Lord, and the Lord took care of him and delivered him from the trouble, and they did it in humility. And... Um, so it says, proclaim, this is verse, Joel 3, verse 9. Proclaim this among the nations. Prepare for war. Wake up the mighty men. Let all the men of war draw near. Let them come up. So which man of war do you want to be? Do you want to be the man of war that has man strength? That we know is going away? Or do you want to be the man of war that's on your knees, but you have the strength of the God of heaven and heaven's armies who turns his eyes to you and he says, don't even look at me because you." his heart, he says, it's that bride thing, you know, and it's hard because, you know, some people are men, but Moses was a man and he had God's heart. It's, it's different, you know, but yeah. And... <clears throat> 
So he says, beat your plowshares and the swords and your pointing hooks into spears. Let the weak say, I am strong. Now, two people are going to be saying this. There's the, if our first image, you know, we have the, the humankind who strives to do everything that God does. You know, they want to heal cancer. But if we would humble ourselves, God would heal cancer, right? It's not a bad desire. And, you know, to build those towers and things, but they're, they're actually weak because they're, they're like grasshoppers to God. But they're trying to say, we're strong. We can do this. We can go to the moon. So that, that company of weak is going to be saying, I'm strong, but they're actually fighting against God who they will never prevail against. But there will be another company of weak people say, I'm weak, but I am strong. And they'll be on their knees, but they will be strong because they're with God and not against them. And if God is for you, who could be against you? Assemble and come, all you nations, and gather together all around because you, your mighty ones, to go down there, O Lord. Let the nations be wakened and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat. They'll be wakened. Who's going to stir himself up to take a hold of the Lord? Come to that valley of Jehoshaphat, and he's going to sit there and judge all those nations. But the sickle for the harvest is ripe. Go down. The wine press is full. The vats overflow, and their wickedness is great. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near the valley, valley of decision. Yeah, so... So when we're in that valley of decision, as Jacob was humbled and weakened by God, he faced decision. He wept. He decided. And he saw the favor and mercy of God. Will I stir myself up to take hold of the Lord? Will I call on his name? Will I cry out in labor and prayer no matter how long it takes? Will I stick it out? Do I have desperation for his presence, for his faith, for his righteousness, his power to overtake me, crumble me to my knees and my weakness? Let all my pride and my selfish ambition and lust of the flesh die so he can raise me back up in power for his glory. God isn't looking for the strong. He's looking for the weak, the humble, the meek, whom he can show himself strong on their behalf. I got to get to the point where I can't live another day without the fire of God, where I can't live in the coldness anymore, where I can't live in the blindness anymore. I don't want to pray away the wrestle of God, which is going to produce the blessing. Everything is to work for the good for those who love him and called according to his purposes. We have to trust him and we're asking for it. We're, we're praying for it. But then as soon as he sends the circumstances to get us there, we try and pray it away. He says, do you really want it? Yeah, I really want it. <laughs> um, <clears throat> prayer is labor. It's difficult on the flesh. It weakens the flesh, you know, and that's, that's another thing. Are we ready for that? Are we ready to be different? Because we, we know we need the power. We can't get through without the power. But the power is going to make us different. And people aren't going to like that. You're going to have a limp. That's weird. It's going to be weird for Jesus. Are we ready? You're going to stand out. And so... Um, just want to end with, we can't, don't wait for someone else to be the Christian you want to be. And you got to stir yourself up. The Holy Spirit in prayer, get motivated. That's what I do for sports. Pump myself up, right? 
watch Without Limits, Chariots of Fire, the music going, just the right playlist. Stir yourself up for Jesus. Worship, pray, read the stories of people who did the greater things and say, Lord, I want that. Like That's the competitive spirit. We can't compete against anyone else, but we can compete against ourselves, our own heart and our own flesh and say, Lord, change me. And if you work as hard as you can for yourself, like that... The way the Bible says, you'll be serving others and low to others, but in your heart, you'll be working out your own salvation, beating your own flesh so that you won't be disqualified yourself. And if each one of us is running as hard as we can, it, it moves us all along. It spurs us all along. And if no one, if everyone's just like, well, I got I got ahead of that person. I'm okay right here. No, that's not the goal. The goal is not to compete against each other. It's to go after the prize, which is Jesus Christ. To be that person that can take hold of God, to stir his heart, to weary him where he turns and looks at you. His eyes search to and fro, looking for the righteous. And I don't know, that's what I want for me. That's why I'm preaching this today is for me. Is that I want... I want to stir myself up to go after the Lord in the greater things. So um, <clears throat> I think that's it. So I'll just pray into that for us. So, so Father God, we just thank you for all that you are and who you are and your mighty and your power and your glory and your heart that were created in your image, Lord God, to to stir you up, but you stir us up, Lord. And um, there's so much truth in your word, Lord God. I just pray that you just write it in our hearts and on our minds, Lord God, and just renew us and transform us, Lord God, and stir up that fire and that passion and that desire and that, that striving to go after the right things, the right achievements, Lord God, that's in your kingdom, after your heart, things that last forever, Lord God. So I just, we know we can't do it without you, but I know I can't do it if I'm lazy, Lord God. So help me, help me in my weakness. The, the, the flesh is weak, but the spirit is willing, Lord God. My spirit is willing, so teach me how to pray. Teach me how to pray through the long, dark night and through for everything, Lord God, and how to be humble and meek, seeking after you. In Jesus' name, amen.